Good evening, Mayor, Council members, members of the community. What I'm going to do is give you a quick up, uh, update from where we were last week when we did an update to just kind of tell you how this last week we thought last week was unprecedented information. And then this week, again, things changed on us pretty quickly. Uh, the biggest changes that we've had to deal with were the orders of stay at home and one coming from the state, one coming from the county health. Um, they are pretty similar. We are operating uh, pretty much under the state order. There's a few tweaks with the county order. There's a couple things that we've put in place for our community, but for most part, they are part and parcel, kind of the same. The only difference right now that we're looking for a little clarification on, and, and I think um, is that the state order ends April 11th and the county order is April 17th, stays in place to April 17th. Right now, we've got to assume we're going to stick with that county date, but who knows what could change between now and then. The other piece that came in is the uh, state's declaration of disaster was accepted and approved by the president. This is going to trigger some eligibility for funding for jurisdictions across the state. However, what that means down to our level is still yet remains to be seen. Um, and so we've got a team that's working on that, working with the county and our coordinating partners at the state. But we probably won't get some info on that for quite some time. We're going to be dealing with that uh, long, long into the future. Um, the orders and the exceptions in the orders did create some confusion kind of across the board, both in the community and, and in the organization, many organizations at our level. Um, effectively, all government services qualify for the exception. And basically, the orders say, hey, look, the government's got to run. Government services have to run. We're going to call that an exception. Uh, we were already working hard, though, to minimize our impact, uh, taking that physical distancing, social distancing mandate um, and direction to another level. So the initial order didn't change how we were doing business, but we really felt it was important to embrace the intent of the governor's order. And so we took that challenge to another level, and we've been working um, both at the end of last week and this week to figure out how do we maximize that and yet still provide high levels of service. We did get a lot of questions, still are getting questions from the community because they're confused. They're saying, why is my business closed? Why is my employer's business impacted? And yet I'm seeing city staff out working in the streets, um, painting the roadways, clearing medians, um, trimming trees, things that most people would look at and say, well, why is that essential and mine's not? There's a couple of things to consider here, and we want to, to really understand this, because even our staff was confused at times as to, well, why is my position essential? Why am I out here doing these things? This work's got to be done. Some of it's a timeliness issue. When we talk about things like trimming the trees, there's a reason that it's scheduled for March, because we've, it's got to be done, and we want to get it done before we get some of those traditional heavy April snows that are wet, and so that takes the trees down. We could create another problem that way. The other piece is um, our staff is got to get this maintenance work done. For instance, I, one of the crew chiefs or one of the staff departments said, hey, right now we know people are adhering to the stay-at-home order. We've got a, a lot of street maintenance that needs to be done. We can do it safely. We can give our crews this physical distancing protocols that allow them to do their job safely. And yet we can minimize the impact traditionally we would have on the community by closing streets or by painting streets or doing some of that maintenance work. So um, while it seems to be on the face of it a conflict, it's really not. It's effective use of time and we're doing it in a safe manner for our staff and trying to minimize the impact in the community for work they're paying for. It has to be done that the community's paying for through their tax dollars. We really want to honor that too, but we get the confusion. The other piece is um, there are not just delays to, uh, or impacts on us and our staff, there's also impacts on things like contracts that we have with contractors and the impact on their workforce, some timelines that have to be done. And one of the best examples I've heard is, you know, if you go down I-25, you're going to see the state has said, hey, look, we're going to keep that construction going. Those contracts are in place. We've got timelines. Right now, we've got access to some of these work sites that we wouldn't normally have with minimal impacts on the traffic. So we're going to take advantage of that. Um, maximize the potential um, silver lining to this bad situation um, so that it minimizes the impact in the community down the road. We're trying to adapt to some of that same philosophy, but we understand it can look confusing at times to the community. Um, 
The other piece is we are creating some small teams. You're going to hear some people talk about it tonight. You're going to hear Beth talk about um, vulnerable populations and how she's working with that homeless population to try to solve some of those issues that are unique. Um, we've got people working with volunteer groups. Uh, San is going to speak to the economic impact. Um, there's really some unique issues with this. Like I said last week, it's not a traditional uh, disaster in that we can't see the water coming. We can't see the edge of the fire. When those events happen, we deal with them and all other work really comes to a grinding halt while we deal with the immediacy of that emergency. And then we start to transition back to recovery and very quickly transition back to um, normal business. In this event, we're having to deal with the incident, the event as it's occurring, and yet simultaneously maintain normal business as much as normal as we can. And also, as Sana will talk to, we're actually going to start talking about and addressing recovery issues all the while while the event is still occurring and we really even can't see the end of it. So it's very unique and, and staff works every day. We start out a day with 100 plus managers on a manager's call so that we can make sure that um, the priorities are consistent and that we're consistent across the organization, both to how we deliver services, prioritizing services, and how we support staff in doing that. After that, we then have another call with a smaller group of about 15 people who are EOC staff. We do this virtually, do both of these virtually, and they talk about higher level management issues, the impacts different decisions departments are making could have on others, um, some of those downstream decisions that you might not think of when you're making a decision in your department that could impact another department and therefore the community. And then we end the day every day with an even smaller group of leadership led by uh, Darren, where we talk about these new issues that are not foreseen, that we didn't anticipate, that are unique to this event, and yet require leadership to make a pretty timely decision, some of them fairly significant, so that we can feed it back to that manager's group and that EOC group the morning and keep those services going consistently. So... Um, all of that is kind of a build on a little more detail of what we talked about last week and how these events are changing things. Um, the biggest impact being those stay at home orders. Um, but we really want to emphasize the fact that we can't, it's, it's not traditional. Um, if this was a baseball game or a football game, we'd have clocks to tell us what quarter we're in, what inning we're in. Uh, we're having a hard time deciding if we're in the fourth, first inning here or the fourth inning. So it's very unique, and our staff is really being agile to try to adapt to it day to day. Just wanted to let everyone know that uh, the police department is still here. We're healthy. We're out and about. We're patrolling. Uh, we're responding to calls, and we're always just a phone call away. Um, some of the things, just so everyone understands, with some of the changes that we have incorporated, when you do call, you may get a uh, dispatcher asking you some questions that in the past they may not have. So. There's a new series of questions. Obviously, it's an emergency and we need somebody responding quickly. We get officers in route very quickly. Uh, but we will be asking questions about uh, people, you know, have tested positive as officers are responding. We want to make sure we keep our first responders safe as well as they are responding and walking into people's homes. So we're asking more questions. And then also our officers are uh, responding a little bit different as well. Um, when the call for service comes out, police officers may be asking for uh, residents to come out and speak with them, and ask them to come outside of their house. Um, sometimes we're taking reports over the phone. We'll just talk to someone. If we don't need to see them face-to-face, -face, we'll talk with them. It's for their protection and ours. Less contact, the better. Um, we're also doing a lot of online reports. So we have a system set up so that people can basically write their own police report and get all the information. Officer can review it online and sign off on it and verify the information and get it back to everyone. So we are doing a lot of uh, kind of change. We're doing a lot of changes in how we are responding, but we're still out there. Our response times are still uh, continuing to get lower. Our officers are doing a great job and we're here and we're healthy. So that was the main thing we wanted everyone to understand. Um, also just that we are not in uh, the business of uh, policing these stay at home orders. Our officers are not um, and will not be out there making traffic stops, asking where people, where they're going. Uh, what are they doing? It's something we just are not doing. If we see an obvious violation of a large group gathering, you know, our officers are using um, education, walking up and, again, keeping distance, but talking with people and explaining that uh, now is not the time. So uh, our officers are doing a great job with that. As we continue, as this incident continues to evolve, we'll continue to uh, address our tactics. 
But we have had one troubling call for service that we wanted to highlight. Um, and I just wanted the, the residents and all of you to know that a couple days ago, we had a uh, female driver pulled over by an unmarked car. We just put this on our Facebook. Uh, Assistant mm-hmm. Chief Fayen just did a Facebook post. So if you anyone wants to go and watch the whole video. But uh, she was driving um, at uh, Harmony and Timberline. It was stopped by an unmarked vehicle. person got out, um, asked for her driver's license and insurance, went back to his car, and which was a pickup truck. And obviously, it was. we found out it was not ours, so it had no markings as a police officer. Um, and went back and did something with the license and insurance and eventually came back and um, told the woman that she didn't create any uh, violations, didn't commit any violations. But what she did do, um, she was checking on these COVID-19 stay-at-home orders. And so that was a red flag, eventually got back to us. And so we are investigating that right now. But know that if you're on a traffic stop like that, we're just asking people to, if they don't, if they feel something is not right, trust their gut. And uh, you know, put your hazards on, roll down the window, wave, let the officer know that you see them and drive to a safe place. You know, you can call 911 at that time and say, you know, I'm being pulled over, but it's an unmarked vehicle. Is this a Fort Collins police officer? Um, and this isn't, it's also, if there's another jurisdiction, they would do the same thing. So drive to a well-lit spot, um, ask an officer to see their badge, get a business card, all of those types of things. But it was a troubling stop. It happened, there was another one that happened in a neighboring community as well. So we wanted to get on this early and make sure everyone knew about it. But uh, all in all, we are seeing a modest reduction in calls for service. People are out there, maybe with the, the less interactions, we are getting less calls and we'll continue to monitor that. But uh, uh, we are out there and available and just a phone call away. Um, as everyone knows and has mentioned, the North Side of Swan Community Center um, started to be used as a shelter on March 17th. Um, we licensed both uh, Murphy Center or Homeward Alliance, Catholic Charities, and, and Fort Collins Rescue Mission to provide those services. It's day, evening, and overnight. Um, day and evening are for anybody. Overnight is for men. Uh, Women Overnight Shelter is still at Fort Collins Rescue Mission and Community of Christ, operated by Catholic Charities. Um, the city provides, of course, the, the facility and everything that goes with that, as well as cleaning. Um, we have a lot of community partners also um, helping in this, and we just want to say how grateful we are for all of their contributions and working with this. Um, Homeward Alliance and Catholic Charities providing the, um, the staffing as well as food, linens, and supplies. Um, we have an anonymous donor providing the, to, the covering the security as well as some additional staffing. And then um, we have, you know, Catholic Charities have been providing the food, but we have a grant in trying to get some additional help to provide more of the food there at uh, Northside as a catering opportunity and prepared food that would be there. Um, The health district started about a week ago, really focusing in on the health screening protocols that are needed um, for the best um, process to make sure we identify accurately people with symptoms and trying to separate people with uh, symptoms and possible um, uh, coronavirus uh, away from everybody else. Um, of course, the reason for having Northside as a shelter to begin with was to enable at least a greater ability to have physical distancing for people. So the gym itself is providing a pretty good space. Definitely overnight, everyone is, their mats are, are spaced out uh, more than the six foot distance. Um, and the daytime, there is ample um, space available. And although some people do are still choosing to be closer together, but they many are separating out. So a little bit hard to force that, but people are trying to make sure. Um, it is still same the same location. So there are the issues with people being lots of people being in that location. And just an idea of the amount is an average of about 150 to 175 people um, throughout the day, not usually at one time, but could be, and then about 80 to 90 men overnight. Um, Additionally, um, we did, so last Saturday, the health district, we did start the the new health screening protocol, and we added um, one of the conference rooms at Northside that's separated from the gym for an area for isolation for people who, um, and that's staffed by the health district by healthcare workers, so they're able to separate then people with the symptoms. Um, There were five, I believe, um, at the end of the day, and just today, the um, the health de- health department was able to provide some COVID-19 testing, and the health district is able to administer those, and people in that room were able to get tested, which was a big step forward from before, because some of them had been sent to the hospital, were not tested, and sent back. 
Um, and this is really helpful. The, the test results will be, uh, will take about 48 hours to get. And then the idea now with the, the ranch being available and the county has been working hard at getting that up and running. And my understanding, uh, Lynn is correct, that uh, has 10 beds to start, but they are ready to expand that if need, if and when needed. Um, so those, that will be a process that we can now start using as well. Additionally, we are actually working hard. Holly Lee Mercerier is helping a lot with some of the oversight and kind of coordination between the shelter providers and everything going on and looking at other options and opportunities. And we currently have in the works another location, a separate location um, with someone uh, stepping up to help purchase maybe a two month lease for a separate um, location for the people with symptoms. So there's greater separation, um, helping that health protocol be uh, better, a better system to have them in a separate location. Um, and then additionally, uh, we have been working the county, the city, as well as the health district, really trying to identify some possible options for temporary housing. So far, uh, a lot of work going into that, but no, um, no opportunities yet. But we did just have a call today with the Northern Colorado Continuum of Care, and on the line was also um, uh, Kristen, Kristen Toombs with the state of Colorado. And they, um, with the disaster declaration, there may be some other opportunities and funds available that could help with maybe some short-term or long-term lease, short-term acquisition type opportunities for other possible uh, temporary housing solutions. But I do wanna mention that um, the, we do still have some, the housing placement system that we have in place is still placing people into housing. Uh, just in the last few weeks, um, we had, I mean, the numbers are fairly small when we're talking about all these people, but we have, there is still movement in there. We have six adults, five families, uh, one, one in permanent and additional six uh, in transitional, three veterans and a few more in the process right now that have been housed just through that process that we already have in place. And then the Volunteers of America, their um, supportive services for veteran families are also known as SSBF program, um, has found some motel uh, leasing opportunities for veterans who are 60 years old or over um, and, and putting them in that temporary housing with supportive services. So there is some that's happening, uh, but I do understand um, the need for more, and we are still working hard to try to identify and welcome any opportunities that people are aware of um, or any um, support or um, help anyone wants to give us in, in trying to find those because we know it needs, we need to find them quickly to provide um, that, that better um, um, op opportunity to have separated housing for people, especially those um, in the at-risk population. And that's really my update. I hope I covered people's questions. First off, I want to say, you know, the work that our economic health office is doing, we couldn't do without all of our regional partners. And this is, goes down from SBA to Governor Polis's office to Office of Economic Development, Larimer County, and others. Um, just so you're aware, we've kind of uh, broken up our office into two focus areas. I'm going to talk about um, both of those. Recovery is very long term. And um, once we get to the recovery space, as well as the, kind of the immediate responses and questions that we've been getting from our businesses and setting up uh, resources and helping our businesses survive to get to the recovery spot. So I would say those are the kind of the two areas that we're focused on. I'm gonna work my way backwards. Um, so for the recovery, we are working with um, Colorado State University, the city of Loveland and our office and finance to really look at what does the economic impact look like for our community as a whole. So we think that's really important to be able to really um, see what this pandemic looks like um, in terms of the economic measures. Um, last Friday, you had um, seen the news release on the Fort Collins Relief and Recovery Fund. We are still working some of logistics out on that, and we should have that out soon, so, but we are still working on that. We also have staff really working on understanding the CARES Act and the SBA and what gaps there would be um, in terms of for our businesses, particularly our small businesses. So we are looking at that. In terms of the current kind of crisis mode responses that we've been dealing with, um, a couple of things. Our website, um, we've been almost updating hourly, daily, um, quite often. So I would say, please take a look at that website. Um, it is fcgov.com backslash uh, business, or sorry, forward slash business. Um, the other piece is um, we just released the open for business GIS map. 
And so businesses can actually um, email us and let us know they're open for business, whether or not um, and what their compressed hours might be or what different types of services they have. We also are adding nonprofits to that. So it's not just for businesses. We're looking at how do we also log all of our nonprofits and, and their sites and what hours and uh, services they're able to provide there. Um, and then um, you'll see that um, next week we will be holding two business town halls. So those will be on the telephone, very similar to what was um, provided last Monday. And um, one will be April 6th from 6 p.m. And those will be an hour long. And then the next one will be on Thursday, April 9th at 10 a.m. And we thought it was important to offer a night opportunity as well as a daytime just because of businesses' hours and their compressed schedules. Um, want to also point out that that will be um, available and translated in Spanish as well as in English. So um, that really is kind of our update. Um, we are working with our county partners um, and our SDDC and others and happy to answer any questions on any resources that you're looking for on that. 